Ash, as your Ash, what? Hmm? <laughs> the it's fuck just like are all these doing? little noises that come from you. What are you doing? No, I, You're okay. I, no, I, I, I was about to say something and then I stopped. <laughs> Me. I'm trying yeah. not to dominate the conversation. I'm trying to sit back. Or you could start by not starting after people have started. Nah. <laughs> Me. Fuck you both. <laughs> Me. <laughs> Good evening. Hi, folks. This is Lewis Herfin, the original Peter Abernathy. Hell is empty and all the devils are here on the Shadow and TV What For podcast with Roger, G, and Big D. Welcome back to Shout on TV Westworld, the unofficial podcast companion piece to the hit HBO series Westworld. I'm one of your hosts, Gene Lyons, and alongside me are my two co-hosts, Big D, Dick Ebert. Good evening. And Ashley Schlafly. Hi, y'all. And this is our weekly Telegraph edition, where we look back at the best email and voicemail from the week. We appreciate everyone writing in and calling in to make this episode uh, possible. Again, if you would like to write in or call in for the telegraph, you can always reach us at host at shatontv.com or call 914-719-SHAT. And this week's episode was titled Past Pawn. Uh, Big D, you weren't with us for the deep dive. We missed you dearly. Thankfully, people still tolerated just me and Ash on a show together. How did you feel about the episode? I liked it more the second time. I texted you. I said, the first time when you watch it for the podcast, you're paying attention to every single detail and you're trying to put whatever quick notes you can do. And the episode always feels like it's an hour and a half long. On the second viewing, I'm like, wow, that kind of went by quickly. So on second viewing, I thought it was a much better pacing. Uh, I didn't have problems with them kind of laying out some of the things we thought we knew. And overall, it just made me sad to think we have one more episode and then we'll be wishing we had more. And all the bitching and complaining or whatever we did about the show, what we wanted it to be, we'll wish we had it. So the short of it was, I liked the episode. Before we get started on these emails, just a reminder that not every email that was sent in uh, was selected. Ashley and I went through and handpicked the best of the best. And some of them have also been trimmed down in length, uh, just so we can fit as many as possible into this podcast. But you can catch them in their entirety on our website, shadowntv.com. Uh, just go to Westworld and the Telegraph section. They're all there. Big D even has them marked by the ones that were read on the air versus ones that weren't. So you can read all of them. And there are hundreds uh, about this season of Westworld at the Telegraph on shadowntv.com. This week's key topics are going to be Caleb, of course. We're also going to talk about how minorities are portrayed in the TV show and some complaints about this episode in particular. Plus, we've got a couple of um actuallys correcting us and our mistakes. And finally, a slew of voicemail uh, that ranges from insightful uh, to just plain bizarre. So without further ado, Big D, hit that telegraph. Our first email comes from Richie H. And he's talking about Caleb's treatment. He says, hey, chat hosts, after hearing Ash speak about the possibility of having multiple sessions of re-education, I think there is solid evidence to confirm this theory. It breaks down into three phases of Caleb's life. Phase one, Caleb is identified by Solomon or Rehoboam as an outlier and assigned to the military. His team is ambushed, leading to the failure of his mission, and he is sent back for his first round of re-education. In phase two, Caleb has undergone round one of re-education, which seems to have worked, and is now, likely unknowingly, working for Sirach using the RICO app to hunt down other outliers. When Caleb and Francis capture Whitman, Francis makes a point to say that RICO instructs them not to talk to the people they capture. When Caleb removes the tape from Whitman's mouth and allows him to speak, the response of Rehoboam, or perhaps Solomon, is to again identify Caleb as an outlier and recalculate the plan. This is why Francis receives the order to kill Caleb. Then, as Whitman talks more, Rehoboam continues to assess the situation and realizes the outcomes are either A, Francis kills Caleb, or B, Caleb kills Francis. With either outcome, the survivor would be taken and re-educated once again. It plays out with Caleb killing Francis, and since he now knows too much, Caleb is again taken in for re-education. And then in phase three, 
Caleb comes out of a second session of re-education therapy. He now has implanted memories of Francis being killed in Russia and given the rest of his backstory. Somewhere soon after, he meets Dolores, and the rest is history. I hope this makes the pod. Thanks for all you guys do. Richie H. Richie, thank you for the email. I texted Gene, and I said, Gene, am I out of my mind? The t- it doesn't make sense when he was re-educated, because not only does Whitman talk, Whitman mentions Sonoma and says, you know, you were there. You remember that place? And I said, well, then why does he not remember that episode if he was reconditioned before? So this breakdown makes it all make complete sense. So Gene was right, and I was right. Well, I think this also plays into kind of what you were talking about, Gene, on the deep dive when you were talking about kind of the similarities between the host and humans that are being laid out, like with the cold storage. This is another example. I suppose that perhaps uh, Solomon's Rehoboam, whomever, is reconditioning people once they make decisions that they can't predict because that's the danger is they're not predictive. And so it makes sense that they would be reconditioned in a way to put them back on their loops, just like how the host were brought down, they were analyzed, they were given their loops and resent back out once they were conditioned to believe that that was what they were supposed to do again. We're seeing that happen here with the humans as well, if Richie is correct. And I, I think that's kind of spot on. And I think also Solomon made a comment in this episode about even though the one out of 10 was successful, there was always a chance that they could actually slide back and they would need to be kind of, you know, get maintenance treatments. Thanks, Richie, for your email. Next up, we have one from Daniel E. from North Carolina, who says, while watching episode seven for a second time, a seemingly meaningless line of dialogue from Francis struck me as a huge clue to Rehoboam's machinations. As he and Caleb drink coffee before they begin their RICO mission, Francis mentions that his daughter seems to always be sick and constantly in need of medical tests. Then it dawned on me, Rehoboam manipulates the health of the outlier's family to strain them financially and force them to make money through the RICO app. In concert with the restrictions Rehoboam places on their employment opportunities, this would be a genius way to force outliers to continue to complete RICO missions. This also explains why Caleb's mom is not missing in cryo storage. As a person with schizophrenia, Rehoboam most likely would have identified her as an outlier and subjected her to the re-education protocols. However, I suspect that she is being maintained in a drug-induced state through her limbic implant, which both renders her harmless to interfere with Rehoboam's predictions and also is the perfect motivation for Caleb to serve as Rehoboam's unwitting enforcer via the RICO app. Another small piece of information in support of this theory is Whitman's comment to Caleb that Rehoboam likely sent the RICO hit offer to whichever person had the most to lose, i.e. the most leverage for Rehoboam to exploit. Thanks for keeping me entertained throughout the lockdown. I'm a physician and clinical researcher, so this show and your podcast have been a welcome distraction from COVID-19. And that comes from Daniel E. from North Carolina. I think what's interesting here is I actually had a thought upon reading this that perhaps this is confirmation that Francis has not gone through the same sort of re-education that Caleb has, because we know that they do not allow the outliers to reproduce. They make that very, Solomon makes that very clear in this episode. And if Francis has a child that is his biological child, I think that gives us our answer right there that he is not labeled as an outlier because he has been able to reproduce potentially, uh, just based off of what we've been told. And so I, I thought that that was kind of interesting. That was the thought that came to mind for me. As far as Caleb's mother goes, I do think that that is an interesting point that she is schizophrenic and wouldn't she be considered an outlier, be, just like how jean Mi was also considered an outlier. But I don't know. I think we still have a lot to learn about this program. And I kind of bummed out that it's we only have one episode left. I think Daniel's right on the money as far as these conditions being like the cornerstones for hosts, right? Hosts had false memories implanted that kept them locked into a loop. The humans have real situations created to keep them locked in a loop. That totally makes sense. It even extends to when Caleb has the uh, recorded version of Francis uh, on his personal assistant, right? His digital assistant where it's it's keeping in touch with him, right? It's reinforcing that type of cornerstone as well. Uh, I do want to highlight the fact, though, like we said in the deep dive, that simply having schizophrenia doesn't necessarily make a person an outlier, right? It's perfectly reasonable to believe that Caleb's mom is just not causing any sort of a divergence and therefore is not a risk to the system and therefore is fine the way she is. 
Um, I do believe that hypothetically, if she were a threat to the system, Rehobo would be like, all right, let's let's put her on ice. I mean, if this is the case, Rehobo is fucked up. There's nothing worse than manipulating someone's, I think, family. Or is it beyond his reach to turn off the ventilator in the hospital to do something like that to cause stress? I don't want to be an asshole here. And this certainly is not meant to be a political opinion, but this is the reality of jobs that I've had and people I've worked with. There are lots of people I know who would not leave their job because they had a sick member of the family or somebody needed medical care. And that was the only way that they could keep their health benefit in order to take care of them. So it's not as fucked up as you think. It's happening right now. Thanks, Daniel, for your email. Next up, we have one from Derek fucking English. He says, the Dolores we saw get her arm blasted off and self EMP is not Dolores Prime. Regarding Dolores' five pearls, there's still one host unaccounted for. The Dolores that was with Caleb speaking to Solomon is not the mastermind that we think she is. Either there's two copies of Dolores in Dolores-style bodies, or the real Dolores Prime is still yet to be unveiled and presumably hiding in plain sight, similar to season two, so I don't expect this to be the reveal. Also, anyone else feel that the cover story that was spun up for Caleb is eerily similar to that of one Mr. Teddy Flood? Veteran of a civil war, went through a bad massacre that was wiped from his memory, ends up becoming a bounty hunter while having the promise for a better life dangling just out of his reach. I don't think Caleb is a host or anything, but perhaps some of the data that Insight purchased from Delos included intriguing backstories that help us as humans stay on our predetermined course and form emotional bonds while providing the motivation to complete the ulterior motives of the mother brain that is Solomon, Rehoboam, etc., Love you guys. Talk to you soon. Derek fucking English. We, I got major Teddy vibes this episode for sure. We talked about on the deep dive about when they're when Dolores and Caleb are sitting there on their horses kind of overlooking the desert. And it was the same score that's played over the scene with Teddy and Dolores in season two. I think that we are, we're getting major vibes. And, I, and I've asked that one of my wish list things is to figure out why Dolores chose Caleb. Maybe that's why she chose him is maybe there's something in him that reminds her of Teddy because we know that Dolores made connections with very few hosts and one of them, probably the deepest other than her father, was Teddy Flood. And so I think it would make a lot of sense that if she's going to choose a human to lead some sort of charge, nostalgia is a real driving force. And maybe that's why Caleb was chosen. And again, I really like that Dolores has shown that she's learned from her, her mistakes with Teddy. This time, she's not forcing the change on Caleb. She's not you know, really pushing it on him that he's going to have to be the leader. You're going to have to do hard things. She is subtly making him come to that conclusion himself. No, no, no. We can't leave yet. You have to see something. We have to see something. You have to see what was taken from you. No, no, no. We got to watch this. We got to watch this. She's not the one to tell him why he should lead the revolution. She's letting him come to that determination himself based on what he learns. And I think that shows some growth in her plan because she fucked up once before and this time she wants to at least get it right. Thanks, Derek, for email. And also, guys, Derek sent in an incredible video, uh, which we will debut this week during Shappy Hour. So if you haven't caught our Shappy Hour, it's at 6 o'clock Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern on Friday nights. Uh, where we get together and just casually talk about Westworld, uh, whatever movie we're doing on Shat the Movies, and just life in general. Derek sent in a video that obviously we can't show you on the podcast, so we're going to bring it out during Shappy Hour. So join us there, uh, and we'll reveal it during that time. It's... It's one for the ages. Thanks again, Derek. And speaking of Twitch, our next email comes from one of our favorite uh, Twitch accounts. It's Black Girl Couch. And she says, Maeve's arc in season one was masterminded by Ford to get her out of the park and away from everything, i.e. the exact selfish motivation which would be in line with the programming via the madam. However, even in that role, her natural nurturing nature cracked through with Clementine to the point that she was affected severely by her death and replacement, despite having less built in a family connection. Was it crappy writing that completely ignored the connection in season two? You damn right it was. But it's not to do with Maeve's consistency of being at heart a mother. So when she discovered the daughter she had was still in Westworld, she chose to accept those feelings to the point that she chose to die for it, which made her the most humane host we had. Now in season two, Maeve gathered a ragtag, lovable group and searched for said child, and yes, it should have been fleshed out much, much more. At least she was actively in control of her destiny and had fun along the way. 
to do what? Save her daughter. And she met some really awesome, friendly future neighbors, but she made a sacrifice and we cried as her daughter looked to finally remember her and we all wanted her back. In season three, it's fuck Maeve. Her daughter is old business. She should have suddenly stopped caring about the only real thing she's ever been exposed to because since she died saving her daughter, Maeve has been a pawn controlled by Ciroc, a point that is consistently overlooked by fans and even Hollywood magazines alike. Apparently, facts in TV shows can be subjective in print. Come on, Westworld. We can be better. While even I am frustrated at Maeve's lack of agency this season, please don't confuse the writer's choices of story arc, padding, with the consistency of her connection to her daughter, especially when a great deal of it stems from lack of attention. Cheers, Black Girl Couch. Uh, So I think Maeve is making a strategic mistake. She's trying to defeat Dolores in order to guarantee the security of her digital child, right? If Ciroc wins this war, he is going to eliminate all the hosts. You need someone to stay as the the guardian, as the gatekeeper for the Valley Beyond. Someone's got to power the system. Someone's got to ensure that it's safe. If you eliminate all hosts, what's to say that in 100 years, 200 years, 10 years, somebody just doesn't forget about the server, turn the power off, whatever, and they're dead. Maeve needs Dolores and the host to at least survive so that she can at least herself serve as the guardian for this digital world. Otherwise, her daughter's dead. See, I think another point that Black Girl Couch is making, though, is they've even diminished the importance of the daughter. Now it's Ciroc saying, you can live in heaven or hell when this is all over. And that's the choice you get to make. So they had to like give her an additional motivation for this. Um, unless we see something huge in episode eight, I totally agree with Black Girl Couch that they've just done this character a great injustice. Well, they've completely marginalized her. I mean, they've turned her into Jedi Maeve only. And we had some complaining that was done in season two when she started to kind of get these all powerful powers. And now this season, that really seems to be her only use is as an assassin. And I talked on the deep dive about motivation. And I agree completely with Black Girl Couch here that we're not seeing the motivation be fleshed out, not just with Maeve, but with a lot of the characters this season, Bernard being one of them. And I think that that's the problem is that they are kind of relying on us to know all these things about these characters. But the hosts, we would have to assume are like humans, they have to grow, they have to mature, their motivations have to change in these nuanced ways and those nuances just aren't aren't happening this season and hey black girl couch you are definitively my favorite person on twitch and i don't think this would be the telegraph without some tinfoil there is the chance that dolores and mave are secretly aligned that they're just feigning this fight oh yeah oh you blew my arm off this goes to the email we got earlier about saying that wasn't dolores prime you know in the episode whitman said uh, that the system is always listening. So the system is probably always watching. Let's have a big fight. Oh, guess what? We're against each other. But they know it makes sense that their interests are aligned. I hope there's more to it. And Maeve is just pretending. She's just pretending. Sorry about the whole Hector thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we got a copy somewhere. I got a USB. Don't worry. Thanks, Black Girl Couch, for your email. Next up, we have one from Cindy, who says, Hey, guys, I've been a fan of your podcast since season one of Westworld. First time writing in. If Rehoboam is the one controlling the underground crime market, I'm annoyed that even in the future, it seems like mostly black or non-white people are engaging in criminal activity, i.e. Francis, Ash, Giggles. If Rehoboam was a perfect AI, wouldn't it have solved race inequality too? Take care, stay safe and healthy, everyone. Cindy. Hold on, Gene. But let, let me just preempt you. Zoom, 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 zoom. Boom, 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 Here he comes to save the day. Okay, you can go. I'm going to bring in a little uh, Watchmen, as Ash and I really like to relate the Watchmen to Westworld. Look, it's only 2052 here. So Rehoboam's doing what Rehoboam does, but we're talking about hundreds of years of social injustice and hundreds of years of institutionalized poverty. And therefore, it is quite possible uh, that you have people who are preconditioned to poor outcomes because that is what history is. So the easiest thing for Rehoboam to do, if Rehoboam was like, hey, uh, I got this problem here. I want to create this perfect world where there's no crime and everything else. What's the easiest way to do that? Well, you take people who are already 
a drag on the system. And I'm not saying that in the sense that minorities are a drag on the system in my view, but I'm saying in a supercomputer, it's like, okay, let's first take anybody who's marginalized and reduce their role in the world, right? It's like, it's, it would be like eugenics essentially, right? And then you take a few select ones who are still problematic and you put them into roles uh, like serving Rico. Again, I am not saying that it is a racial issue, a genetic code issue, or anything that's even a cultural issue, but rather that an AI would see anybody who has already been put down socially as the easiest part of the society to cut away. It's the, the quickest solution. I completely completely agree with you and then I I know that this is this sounds terrible but another thing that I think we have to consider here is that we keep talking about a, a utopia we don't we don't know if that's what's being created here we know that they're doing everything they can that Sorak is doing everything he can to ensure humanity's survival and he's willing to sacrifice and that may mean that it isn't survival for all right it's survival for the chosen few that will allow him to ensure the survival of the most people and inequalities of all kind, oppression of all kinds. I mean, that does nothing but continue to push forward those oppressor groups. So I think it would make sense that the supercomputer would use that as as an asset. But I, I will say, which is, again, is terrible. But I will say I was so glad to get this email from both Cindy and Black Girl Couch because I had messaged you guys in Slack and nobody responded to me about how does it make anybody super uncomfortable that this season the marginalized characters are the people people of color on the show. I mean, Maeve's character, Bernard's character, they've been completely marginalized. And then these new characters that have come in, they're these little bitty one-offs like Ash and like Giggles. And, and like you're saying, they're playing these, you know, very stereotypical roles. And, and I'm hoping that there's a purpose for all of that. And maybe that also makes me a social justice warrior, which I'm not ashamed to be. But I think that the, I think that that's a, a huge issue this season. And there's a lot of stuff actually that's being written about it right now. Uh, so I don't, I don't know. Well, what fucking show are you guys watching? You guys are being selective. You're picking Giggles, Ash, and Francis. Let's forget about uh, the assault team that went after them in the Bulletproof Uber. Majority Caucasian. Let's go after the two hitmen who tried to kill Dolores in the ambulance. Two Caucasian hitmen. Let's go to the guy delivering drugs when they're going to try to kill Dolores when she's out cold. A Caucasian man. If you go back and do the math, a majority of the people here are not marginalized. It's white dudes. There's other ways to be marginalized other than race, though. I mean, they could be marginalized socioeconomically. I mean, they've, they've made very clear on the show that you're being pushed into using Rico yes. because you're being held down in these jobs where you're not able to earn enough to make a living. So marginalization is not just limited to, to race. It's also there's many ways to be an oppressed group. Right. But the email says mostly black or non-white. It doesn't say poor. The email is addressing the the race of the RICO participants. A majority have been Caucasian. A vast majority. Yeah, and on the flip side, there's excellent representation on the Delos board. There's an Iranian. Why why are there not more women hitmen in RICO? I want to see women doing personals. There's some some of those those groups though. We don't know if they were hired by Rico or if they're just well paid, you know, security groups like those, like with Connells. I mean, we don't know that all of those people were brought were brought in through Rico. But I, I I mean, I think that Cindy brings up something that a lot of people are are talking about with this season, and 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 again, especially with Maeve and, and Bernard. I think it's a huge bummer what's happened to to their characters. Yeah, yeah, we do know it was Rico because Caleb got the call. He said, "Those are not cops. Those are not cops." He got the call. So I would assume, and I don't mean to be the dick here. No, you're not the dick. You're just, you're just the, you're just the middle-aged threatened white man. We get it. Oh, I'm not threatened. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not threatened. You too. Okay. For people listening at home, Big D normally sits patiently and waits for people to finish what they're saying. As soon as he sees us going on a social justice warrior tear, it's, he's doing the hokey pokey. Yeah, he's he is. Uh, 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 uh. He turns red. Yeah. It's okay, Big D. You're still going to be in control of this country for another 10 to 20 years. It's, you're fine. Oh, my goodness. Zoom, 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 zoom. Boom, 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 boom. We're coming for you. The Browns and the women, we're coming. The gays, too. We're coming you're for you. You're whiter than I am right now. You're whiter than I am. I've been out in the sun. All right. Moving on from that, uh, we get a, a very good question coming from Matt K. Uh, he says, hey, everyone, I got one big question I've waited to send along for a while. And I have to admit, I feel really stupid not knowing what the answer to this is. Why don't bullets matter this season? 
Dolores stands in front of Caleb after getting off the subway a few episodes ago and takes plenty of gunfire from close range. Then Clementine takes her fair share this episode too, and it doesn't phase her either. Am I missing something here? Am I really this dumb? Probably. I'm having a hard time believing they're in danger at times, and I would love you all to set the record straight. Great job this season as always. Thank you for all the time you put into this. Cheers, Matt K. I have to think that's a failure on Christopher Nolan and Lisa Joy's part. They've not told us what can kill a host, what can hurt a host. We know, yes, if you squish their Cadbury egg, they're dead. But Maeve goes down with just a gut stab. That's it. But yet, Charlotte gets blown up, set on fire, and she just walks it off. I think that's a failure of the show. We need to know that if somebody gets shot, what it takes to kill them. Otherwise, we're going to think that everyone is just going to get up. Well, apparently they need to be cut in half. I mean, that's that's apparently what needs to happen. I'm waiting for a Terminator 2 part where they're just going to start like clawing <laughs> with their hands. Themselves. That could happen. I don't know because they haven't told me what can happen. I need to know the rules. Well, there is a difference also between hosts in park and out of park, right? So in park, I think they were programmed to shut down when shot. And that serves a, a lot of purposes. One is it's easier for the guys working down in the in the body shop uh, to repair a host that's been shot one time as opposed to a hundred times. But also it would scare the shit out of guests. If you're just shooting them, they just kept coming at you. No one would want to come back to the park. They'd be like, fuck it. William would like it. Man in black would be cool. With it. Everybody else would be like, we're, we're getting the fuck out of here. This sucks. Well, that's how you got the best shirt for for shot on TV, though, is the guy that got shot multiple times and he's drinking the milk and it's fallen out of his stomach. You know, I mean, if, if we didn't get that moment in the park, then we would never have the best piece of merchandise possible. So that really is a great T-shirt. Thank you. <laughs> I, I can't <laughs> find mine. Oh, maybe I got to get you a new one. You should probably buy me another one, Big D. I think we could do that. Where, where could I buy that? Uh, you can get it on <laughs> the Shadow oh, TV shameless store. Plug. Just go to shadowntv.com slash shop, and you can find that T-shirt, plus many more, including uh, the Big D shirt, the Big D mug. We got Roger's World, uh, everything there. Just go to shadowntv.com slash shop uh, and pick up your merch. Next up, we have another complaint from another Matthew. This Matthew writes, hey there, crew. Dear God, episode seven brought bitter teeth gnashing tears of a frustrated nerd to my eyes with the sheer amount of money spent on the show one would think they would have someone on staff to point out these types of things one the shootout between musashi slash sato and clementine fuck they were like three meters from each other clementine had a little bit of cover with the dead body and a perfect target that wasn't ducking and weaving how that ended up with only clementine getting one round in the shoulder is beyond me Two, when speed is an important factor, horses are used, and a city slicker like Caleb can ride a horse proficiently and dismount without falling off and having his foot caught in the stirrup. Three, attacking a mega secret compound that apparently is worth more than the combined GDP of 15 industrialized nations that has a small handful of guards that stop to smoke while on duty that can be taken out with a 50 caliber drone guided rifle where no one thought to question the drone flying around or any other AI controlled security to register the fact that it is there Four. Maeve can mentally take over any robot or host as proved by the worker robot grabbing Dolores. Why didn't Maeve just freeze Dolores' motor functions? I guess it comes down to the fan service of having the fight between the two and the overly dramatic finish of Maeve being rendered dead by the EMP. Couldn't she also stop the controlled 50 caliber rifle Dolores had set up? 4.5, a sword to a gunfight? Really? Probably just for the fan service factor again. Thanks for all the work you do in the podcast. It's really appreciated. And that comes from Matthew, a.k.a. Bandacy. Okay, so I'm going to go back a couple emails. The only way this can make narrative sense is if Dolores and Maeve are just pretending to have a problem. They're not trying to kill each other, right? So you have Maeve with her gunship. We want to put on a good show for Ciroc. Just shoot around her. Dolores really isn't trying to hit her. I mean, yeah, the Musashi thing, that's a joke. They're like five feet away. You would have to try to miss. He probably hit her in the shoulder. It was like, oh, shit, sorry about, sorry about that. I didn't mean to hit you. The only way this could really come out to where it doesn't look ridiculous 
is that they were just play fighting. I don't know. I don't I don't know if I buy that, y'all. I mean, I We can hope. I, I don't know how I would feel about it. <laughs> and I, I maybe I hope that that's true. I don't know. I don't know what I hope. Uh, but I think that at this point, a lot of those plot holes that Bandicide is pointing out, the only thing that I think makes sense to me is that this is a simulation and that this is, you know, it's funky for a reason. Kind of like how when we were watching the Nazi scenes and we were like, what is going on? And, you know, now we're getting another another scene where we're going, what is going on? And then it's going to be revealed that it's none of it's real. So Bandicide as we're preparing to launch a couple different streams on Twitch uh, that are video game streams, I've been studying on a lot of games out there, including Counter-Strike and Warzone and Destiny 2. The Musashi host actually might be based on me because I also can't hit shit with a submachine gun from about nine feet away. So, uh, you know, it's reasonable to believe. Uh, he also maybe, maybe had a couple drinks there in Jakarta, got him a little buzzed. I don't know what was going on there. Thanks for your email, Matthew. Uh, next up, we have one from Mike from England. And he says, hey, guys, throughout this season, we've seen the Rehoboam round eclipse looking thing as a representation of world order and how well its plan is proceeding. We've also seen spikes when something unusual it hasn't predicted happens. However, you'll notice it isn't ever a perfect white circle. Around the edge is a small corona of black activity, all low level. I think this corona is the outliers. The vast majority of outliers can be dealt with by nudging them toward dead-end jobs with no prospect of them becoming in a position to cause any real issues, like nuking a city, for example. Some who have the right aptitude are nudged toward the army where Rehoboam can use them to achieve its goals, or alternatively, they die, in which case they also never end up being in a position to cause problems. Whenever you see a big spike, it's something quite unexpected for Rehoboam. It then moves into action to either kill them outright or repurpose them. Using a solar eclipse as a metaphor, the general background black activity is your standard solar activity on the surface. Unpredictable, but stable and of no real concern. When Caleb learns the truth and kills Francis, it's like a solar flare, a bit more serious and it needs to be looked at a bit closer. When Dolores released all the data to the whole world, it was like a coronal mass ejection. These can actually cause real problems. In fact, they can essentially act as an EMP coincidence to electronic things on earth if earth is in the firing line okay so there are my thoughts i'd love a bit of feedback and as always keep up the good work stay safe stay indoors and please for the love of god don't inject yourself with disinfectant kind regards mike from england so we've already seen this season what happens when you overload a system the simulation with uh, sizemore and mave if you overload rehoboam with situations that he has to process and predict they're all going to become un unreliable. It causes him to actually have to slow down. He can't focus on manipulating all the individual pieces to make them all come true. So I think just not only swapping the system, but also that serves to mask what's really going on with Dolores and potentially Maeve. So all season, I've been curious as to what the imagery is. Uh, it reminds me a lot of that movie Arrival. I don't know if you guys saw it. I think it's a great movie. And uh, I think that it's very similar to the writing that they use. And I think it's beautiful. And other than it just being pretty, I didn't think it served much as a per much of a purpose. But I think that you're kind of onto something here. And I would be really curious to have it explained out and what all those different points of origin are. And I, there's got to be some sort of logic behind it. And I think that you started to kind of break that down for us here. Thanks, Mike, for your email. Next up, we have one from Stephen, FA7682. He says, something tells me that Dolores Prime is in Germany. It's the only thing that makes sense for the series going forward. For three seasons, we've been watching her grow and become independent. It would be a waste to completely disable the main focus of the ensemble mid-series. She's been willing to sacrifice other versions of herself to get the job done, but I don't think she would risk the possibility of not having an uncorrupted copy of herself pulling the strings. The version of Dolores we saw in Mexico is probably more like a captain leading the ship into battle. She is trusted with most of the plan, and Dolores Prime is giving commands from the metaphorical homeland. I also wouldn't be surprised if Maeve took a similar approach. After she was killed fighting Yakuza Dolores, Sirak warned her that he would punish her if she fails. He also asked her what she wanted, and she says she wants what Dolores has. 
At this point, Maeve knows Dolores' strategy for executing her plan, and there is no reason she couldn't emulate it in some fashion. Neither of these characters are dead. Thanks for all the work you do. I don't know how I would feel about the season if I didn't get some of Ashley's insight. Oh. It probably wouldn't look like anything to me. I hope you have a great week. Stephen FA7682. Well, thank you, Stephen. Uh, but I think that you are probably really predicting what's going to happen in the cold open of the season finale. I think that's going to be our big cold open is the reveal of who is in Berlin and whose body it's in, whether it's Teddy Flood or a crazy Dr. Ford or something like that. I think we're going to finally see Berlin in the cold open and get to know who Dolores Prime is this season. And I agree with you. I, I do think that more and more we're starting to see that the version of Dolores we've been with this season, if she's not a simulation, she clearly is not that Dolores Prime. She's too kind. She isn't She isn't Wyatt enough of a Dolores, I think, to be the Dolores Prime. So I'm curious to see who it is, though. Thanks, Stephen, for your email. Uh, next up, we have two um actuallys, corrections to things that we said on the podcast. And the first comes from Mimac, who says, um, actually, when you get a pawn to the last rank of the chessboard, you can promote it to whatever piece you want, excluding a king or pawn, regardless of what pieces have been taken. For instance, even if your queen has not been taken, you can still promote your pawn to a second queen. Lucky king, am I right? So you almost always want to promote your pawn into a queen, unless, of course, promoting to a queen stops your opponent from moving any pieces, causing a stalemate. Or if by promoting to a knight, you put your opponent in a forced checkmate situation, a scenario where the opponent has little to no moves left that lead to an unpreventable checkmate. Hope this helps you beat your husband more in the future. And I love the podcast. That comes from Mimek. Okay, so I have gotten the riot act from Tom since he heard the deep dive that I said this wrong. We got so many um, actuallys about this. We got somebody who's a former like chess club president, all these things. Yes, yes, I spoke incorrectly. I am wrong. This clearly shows how poor of a chess player I am because I've always lost my queen by the time I can get a pawn to the other end of the board because I am a very aggressive chess player because I can't stand all the the waiting around and I just I push my queen out way too soon apparently who knew but yes I was wrong you are right I apologize Ash as your co-host it is my responsibility to catch things like that and correct you but I also do not really know how to play chess very well and I I have a a genuine question about that which is if your pawn gets promoted to queen and your queen's already alive where do you get the other queen from you just say everybody pretend it's a queen? Usually you flip over a rook. That's what I remember. But what if you have both your rooks still? I don't know. Then you just fucking, <laughs> I don't know, you get a, a napkin and put like a little something Should I on call the Tom in here? I don't know. Yes, call Tom in here. Get him in <laughs> Put here. a fucking nickel down? May, maybe I'll take one of your pieces. May, I know. I, Hold on. Do you really want me to ask him? Hey, Tom. Let's see what he's wearing today. If the cabana boy's in the house. Can you come here? We have a chess question. We'll put pants on. No, keep the pants off. He's got to put pants on. Hold on. Why? Pants off, Sperry's on. They said you can come with your pants off. Yes, it's encouraged. Thai food with pants? No. Okay, so you turn your... He was on the phone. But uh, you turn your rook over. Yeah. And if you still have both your rooks, he says it's highly improbable that you would already have your pawn at the other end. He said that he's not sure what you would do in that situation, but that he will research it. My high school uh, chess teacher would be proud of me. As an aspiring chess bully, I'm just going to start showing up to matches with an extra queen and just set it on the <laughs> side of the table. I'll be like, this is for later. Oh, yes. You should have it like specially made, right? <laughs> yeah, this is for later. Yeah. Fucking gene move for yeah. sure. Exactly. The next time actually comes for me and it comes from Chris from Fargo, the town, not the movie or show. And uh, Big D and I were talking about what a can opener is. And I was referring to a can opener uh, as chopping somebody's mouth from side to side and popping their head off or doing it with somebody's entire body like Musashi. Big D said he thought it was an MMA move. Turns out it is. Chris writes, um, actually, the can opener is an MMA move slash hold. You pretty much never see it in modern professional MMA. I don't think this is what the man in black was discussing, but it is a legitimate MMA thing. And then he included several videos on how to do it. So 
I did watch it. I'm not going to sit here and explain how to can opener. Uh, but the basic premise is that somebody has you in guard. You can rock them up towards you to break guard. And then with your hands on the back of their head, almost like a Muay Thai clinch, you push their head downward and the, the strain on their neck will cause them to open guard or just be in a shit ton of pain. Now that Chris points it out, I do recall George St. Pierre using this a couple times in fights. Uh, so I have seen it before. Uh, Gene, will you be adding this to your repertoire of uh, deadly combat moves? It's incredibly inefficient. So in general, I would never try to submit anybody while in guard to begin with. But uh, the first clip that Chris showed does show how to properly do this, which is you're in guard, you're dropping elbows on the person. If they try to cover up or clinch up, then you would move them into a can opener just to get their guard open and then go back to hitting them again. So there, there is a place in the world for it. It's more of a guard breaker, I would say, though, than a submission. But thanks for the education, Chris. I understood 5% of that. And I feel like that's more than I would have at the beginning of my recording with y'all. So, Well, when we finally do a ShatCon, or if you and Roger ever have your great fight, uh, I'm sure we'll see the can opener pulled out. <laughs> yes. We will. Well, we'll put it on the list of things for Big D and Sarah to teach me, so. Oh, oh, I'm not a trainer now? I No, you said you were going to be his chain, yeah. Yeah, but you get Sarah and Big D? Yes, oh, I get both. Uh, but come on, please. You're a level four. Come on. We expect more from you. You're a veteran. You're airborne and she's a black belt. Doesn't work. Yeah, but I am 5'2", have never fought before, and I'm very oh. fragile. Roger's only had push fights. Ashley, I can tell you have some pent up rage. I would not <laughs> want to fight you. You will break loose and like try to just rip skin and pull people's eyes out. I, I've got I've got my money on you. I wouldn't fight dirty. Oh, I see something. I yeah, you would go buck wild. I can tell. You're listen. There's that thin line. Each day you're like, I had a bad day, y'all. But inside, I know that you're like <sighs> ready just to break out. I feel like I've been very seen and and judged on this podcast. <laughs> no, you're not judged. <laughs> Everybody needs to vent. Is it making you angry? Are you feeling violent? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you want to break something? You won't like me when I'm angry. Thanks for all your email, everybody. We're going to move on to voicemail. And our first one comes from Brett in Marlboro, New Jersey. What's up, Shat Crew? It's Brett from New Jersey. I wanted to send in this telegraph, even though I know I missed the deadline for this week's episode. I wanted to get it in as soon as possible. I think that they've telegraphed the end to Ciroc a little bit too much this season with the use of the hologram glasses. They've been used since the very first scene of the season and throughout the entire season on and off in ways that are meant to trick us or make us think that someone is in a room when they are really not. I think that Maeve or Dolores or one of the Dolori will track down where Serac is actually in real life, and while he is in the simulation or hologram talking to someone, they will kill him in the real world, and we will see how that plays out while he's interacting in the hologram or simulation. If you guys have watched Battlestar Galactica, which I'm sure some of you have, the spin-off Caprica did a similar thing in the final episode of their series thanks for all you guys are doing i love the podcasts keep it going and i'll love to hear your thoughts on the end of the season brett does not sound like he's stressed out about coronavirus at all mm -mm. brett brett's just laying back he's you know chilling out enjoying new jersey just looking out the window so we're now over 20 episodes just for this season of Westworld. And I want Brett on the podcast because he would be the easiest guy in the world to edit. You can clip anywhere in any of those sentences and it'd be perfect. Brett also is really into obscure sci-fi. So he pulled up Caprica, which I had forgotten about entirely. And I was like, oh shit, Caprica. Brett, thank you for bringing Caprica back into my memory entirely. I'm so excited. Might actually have to watch it again after Westworld. But Brett, I like it. This is why Dolores and Maeve are working together. 
because nobody knows where Sirak is. They're going to double team him. And as one of them, you think he's going to give a final death blow to Dolores. Maeve's going to pop up and get him like, like Palpatine. Just bah. I like your thinking, Brett. And you can send me whatever you're on because I need to, I need to have a couple of relaxing days here in Florida. <laughs> Thanks, Brett, for your voicemail. Next up, we have one from Christopher in Minnesota. Hey, Shaq crew. Uh, this is your old pal, Chris from Minnesota. Longtime listener, sometimes caller. And really want to really quickly bring up one of my theories that I have for Westworld. Uh, there's a book that I absolutely love that I read a long time ago called Neuromancer by the great author William Gibson. And in that book, it basically tells the story of an AI searching for its other half. And during the course of it, uh, the AI, Wintermute, is only capable of doing certain functions. And so it goes out in search of its other half, Neuromancer, who is able to construct personality and identity to ultimately merge into what's called the super AI. And I couldn't help but start thinking that, you know, what if Dolores' endgame isn't to destroy Rohoboam, but actually maybe merge with it? And then this got me thinking that if you take a look at modern marketing research and how it's done, there's a school of thought where they look at qualitative versus quantitative data. Quantitative, you know, the hard numbers on how things are ranked and where they align, but qualitative in terms of truly where do consumers or your customers find things that move them, that they're passionate about, trend, things that they want to move forward to. And I can't help but feel that Rehoboam and Dolores kind of represent these two parts. Rehoboam, the quantitative pure numbers group who can analyze massive accounts for data to identify those basic trends, but then Dolores was able to create identity and personality. So that got me thinking that what if like Wintermute and Neuromancer, Dolores is looking for this other half of an AI to merge with and become a super AI and become something totally unique. I think it would present a really interesting next season of the show. Um, again, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, keep doing what you're doing. Love hearing you all. Uh, love the new addition with uh, Ashley. And uh, can't wait for more. Thanks. Yeah, I think that this might be setting up for what season four will be. I, I, I've had a lot of trouble thinking, okay, where are they going to go from here? And I, I mentioned that I would really dislike if it were a cliffhanger season where you know, it was kind of like, ah, as like the sword comes down, does it hit Dolores or does it hit Sorak or not? You know, I think that would be a really terrible way to end the season. And I think that maybe this is it. I, I like your example of quant versus qualitative uh, data because I think that you're right. We're Hoboam's you know, it spends all these numbers and Dolores is actually out talking to people like Caleb and bringing these experiences in. And if the two of them merged, if she and Solomon joined teams, I, I don't know if anybody would have a shot. I mean, do, do you even think that's possible? Solomon makes it clear. We're very different. We're very different in what we're intended to do. And I think maybe the design is very different. Other than the two of them outliving their purpose, I don't know if they could be merged. Well, the show's very loose with its technology. Everything seems to be able to interface with pretty much everything else. So I don't know if that's really something they're taking into an account. Chris, I think that if Dolores was searching for Rehoboam in a way to bond with Rehoboam, she would have done it already. I mean, she knows where Rehoboam is. She's had access to Rehoboam. So I don't think that's necessarily the case. Um I did want to talk about Neuromancer, though. This is a book that has popped up throughout my life. So Neuromancer, I believe, was written like in the mid 80s. And ever since I was a teenager, I've been told, read this book, read this book, read this book. So I'll definitely add this to my reading list. It's actually already on there on Goodreads. And so I just need to get around to to actually reading it. But uh, it sounds like something that would really entertain me. And I, I do wish that Westworld would have gone in that sort of a direction. I don't know if that's what they're going for. From a literary topic to something a little bit different, our next voicemail is talking about Dolores in episode seven. Hey guys, uh, I have no uh, ideal of grandeur that maybe you would play this on the podcast. I don't give a shit. I just wanted to tell you personally that wasn't it really fucking awesome when Dolores got her fucking arm blown off? You're like, <laughs> oh shit, she's going to die. I actually thought dude, she was going to die. It was a really nice twist. It was really awesome. So I hope you guys enjoyed it too. Bye. <laughs> I love it. Is that Tom? 
<laughs> it is not Tom. <laughs> That's why Tom's on the phone. He's leaving us voicemails. Right, he's leaving That's us Tom. voicemails. No, no, that is not Tom. Um, but I do. I love this because it's very much like, you know, Big D's like, fuck yeah. You know, yeah. The, she fucking got her arm blown off, man. Like, this is another very chill quarantine person. I believe that my note when that happened was I said, oh, shit, I can't believe they blew her arm off. So I found my kindred spirit. I really liked Dolores's arm getting blown off. The effects were spectacular. It looked great. I just wish they wouldn't have foreshadowed it so much. Make it a surprise, for God's sake. She could have been undercover and still gotten her arm blown off. Yeah, I mean, my favorite part of this voicemail, though, is that he just doesn't give a shit if it makes it yeah. on the telegraph or not. That's it's just the best. Like, here, I'm going to call in. Don't really give a shit if you play it. Just want to say it's fucking cool. That's what we're about on Shadow on TV, making dreams you don't even have come true. <laughs> and finally, we have a voicemail from Dr. J from Austin, Texas. Good morning, Chat Crew. This is Dr. J from Austin, Texas. It's Tuesday. I'm waiting on the deep dive episode to come out for Westworld. <clears throat> the penultimate episode, and I just got finished listening to your Instacast. And uh, I just had a couple things to say quickly to you. For one, I've been meaning to call in and say, Ashley, uh, w- what a breath of fresh air you are on the on the podcast. Love having you. I think you fit in really, really great with these guys. I think there's conversations started because you're there that, that weren't happening otherwise. And a wonderful addition. So welcome. I'm a longtime listener, and I love that you're there. Uh, number two, I got to stick up for Big D because I, I kind of fancy myself. I'd be Big D if I was in the group. Uh, big guy, 40s kid, you know. Big D, it sounds like you got some hate mail for your attempt to Frenchify the name Ciroc. And if anyone is, is calling you out on that, sir, that's a hard, fricative consonant sound, the back trilled R that both Ashley and Gene do so effortlessly. Uh, that's real hard, man. And you gave it a good, good stab, but, but listen, that's, that's, that's not even a, as egregious as how Rod says the word didn't. He says didn't it. D-I slash N-I-T. Didn't it. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's worse to me. I, I think your front tap R with Sedoc was a nice try at, uh, at what they were doing. But the, you just gotta know. That's tough, man. That's tough. Uh, lastly, I want to say I love this episode because I really do feel like uh, I flipped. I really do feel like Dolores kind of is the good guy now. Like she went to fight this revolution knowing that she would never work. Uh, it would never work for her, but she wanted to at least do it for the humans. I really did it for the outliers at least. So I think that is really flipped what the way I look at everything this season. And that's that's what I believe. I think she knows she's going down. She she knew this would never end well for her or the hosts. So at least she could do it for the outliers, which is cool to me. Anyway, love the show. Love everything you guys do. Thanks for your time and doing it. Talk soon. So I like this idea, Dr. J. We've been looking for what Dolores' motivation would be. And so far, we thought total host domination, wiping out the human race. We also know, though, that her exposure in Westworld was to the 1% of the 1%, right? The upper, upper crust of humanity, right? These are the people who are the haves and the half mosts. So maybe when she goes outside of the park, that idea of decoherence, she interacts with this environment and realizes, oh no, this is not what everybody is like. This is what just a very few are like. Let's fuck those really few as hard as we fucking can. She knows that her race is doomed. She gets the news that everybody at Westworld is is burnt up, right? Cold storage has been completely uh, extinct. There's just a few hosts left in the world. And maybe she realizes that they're not as perfect as she thought they were. The possibility exists that maybe she's siding with Caleb. I'm not saying that as a prediction, but I could see where this story would develop. Uh, so, Ashley, how far is uh, Austin from Houston? About two hours. Well, I think when we ultimately do our Texas meetup, you know, once the corona decides to leave... Uh, I think we would send out an invite to Dr. J. He sounds like a guy we'd want to sit around. I, I picture we're in Texas. We'd be having like an outdoor fire. We'd have some some beer on ice. We'd have a grill. And I think we got to send him an invite. 
Yeah, all that sounds great except for the outdoor fire because it's hotter than hell at night here. So we don't need <laughs> it's not the desert. So we don't need an outdoor fire here. But I'm I'm down for that. I, I also really thank you very much for the kind words, but also I love the fact that even though Gene and I got the hate for the French pronunciation, Big D got a call in defending him against the hate that Gene and I got. So the love for Big D goes on and on and on. It's because I'm simple Jack. They're going to defend me because they feel like I need it. That's why. They're my no. people. That is not why. You're you're likable. Here's the thing is on any given day when we come into this podcast, there is a 90% chance that I am pissed off about something. And I'm also very impatient with everybody around me. That's that's who I am. That's That's what I do. There's also a chance that Ashley is going to be ruminating about something very deeply. She has given an email a ton of thought. She has probably researched the shit out of something. And that's going to impact the way she talks about it. It's going to be very, very detailed. Big D just comes in. He's like, hey, guys, what's going on? It's been a great day here in Florida. (laughs) No, you, you make it sound like I don't put in notes or do research. No, no, no. That's not what I'm saying at all. Oh, okay. That's how you read it. There might be something on your conscience, Big D, that you want to talk about. No, but, you better be careful. I'm going to turn the army on but you. The thing is, <laughs> but the thing is, Big D, no, what I'm saying is that you come in, you're steady, you're kind, you're always playing referee, you're the peacemaker on the podcast. And I think that comes through the audience. They know that you just, you're a good person at heart. So it's okay if they're like, yeah, fuck Gene, he's an asshole. He sounds smug. You're right. I do because I am. Well, I, mean, I just think if you look at just our, our our real lives, I would say I've got a 50-50 shot of people liking me in real life. Like it isn't, I'm not one of those people that everybody likes. I've always been one of those people that you either like me or you really don't like me. And I feel like, Gene, you're very similar to me in that regard, that not everybody, lots of the ladies like you, I feel like, but like, you know, well, like Black Girl Couch, like on Twitch. Mm. Oh. She's going to have some girl time after our, our Twitch cast. But, you know, I mean, the point is, is that I think that you, you know, you're similar to me. We're very divisive personalities. And I don't think either of us give two shits about people really liking us either. Big D, you're this nice, kind guy. I feel like everybody you meet, you everybody likes you because you can't help but dislike you. And that's why if you look at our Slack conversations, Gene's getting angry about something. I'm responding. And then you send a GIF and everybody loves it and sends happy faces and all right is right in the world again. So you're wonderful. I've always enjoyed the company of different people. Traditionally, you know, you might not be the the, the first co-host that you think of for chat uh, Shout on TV, shout the movies. But I like when someone is genuine, when they come from a completely different direction than I am. So I also tolerate people. I see everyone's flawed. I have huge flaws. We each have our own baggage. But I tolerate the baggage in other people as long as they're good people. Gene, yes, there's days, Gene, I want to strangle him. But you know what? I know that that's not the way you deal with Gene. You deal with Gene a certain way. You deal with Ashley a certain way. People deal with me a certain way. And I think it's because I'm tolerant, but also I see the value in different people. So I try not to fight. I see where they're coming from. And, you know, if, if that makes people like me, I appreciate it. But, but also I enjoy what I'm doing here and I enjoy the people I do it with. Well, the truth of it is that Ashley and I have an acute sense of our own mortality. And so we just won't suffer other people. You, on the other hand, you have more of a infinite life view of the world and so that allows you to just uh, be patient with everybody and i'm kind of jealous of that i wish i liked people more i do i wish i I wish i could make eye contact with people more and be genuine when i smile back at them i think that would be a really nice thing to do (laughs) (laughs) you know but most days i just keep my head down and look at my coffee and drink it furiously and get to my office so (laughs) So for people at home who can't see uh, our video chat with each other, Ashley's face is like 60% covered by a microphone most of the time. And now I'm like, what faces is she making? Well, you see it on Shappy Hour. See, that's the problem is that it would be appropriate in this situation. You can't see my face because I don't have a GD webcam. I just have the lantern that my phone is on. But you can see it on Shappy Hour. I mean, I sit there. If you ever see me like duck down like this in Shappy Hour, it's because I know I can no longer control what's happening on my face and all the honesty is there. And so I get very sheepish. And that's a terrific segue uh, into our invitation to you, everybody. If you're listening to this, it is Friday. 
watch Shappy Hour, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern at shadowntv.com slash Twitch. Uh, you can join us there, see Ashley make faces, see me get angry. Uh, Big D might make another cameo. It's pretty exciting when he does. Also, Roger does Westworld Live immediately after the episode on Twitch, same place, shadowntv.com slash Twitch. Uh, and you can join him there to talk about the episode immediately. It's going to be a big one. This is the finale, so we expect the crowd to show up and talk on there. So you can check all that out at shadowntv.com slash Twitch. You can also follow us on Twitter, Snapchat, and Instagram at shadowntv. On Facebook, just search for shadowntv Podcast. The website is shadowntv.com. And again, you can email us at host at shadowntv.com or call us at 914-719-SHAT. That concludes this week's episode of Shad on TV Westworld, where everywhere fine podcasts can be found, including iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Pandora, Spotify, and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe. And if you stop by iTunes, please leave a review that helps the podcast grow. Also, check out our sister podcast, Shad the Movies, where we cover 80s and 90s movies. Uh, some really great ones coming up. And thank you so much to everyone who has commissioned films. Uh, we are booked up through December and we cannot thank you enough for those commissions. It really helps us do shows like Westworld uh, and other TV podcasts that require a lot of hours and a lot of resources. On behalf of my co-hosts, Big D, Dick Eber, Ashley Schlafly, Raj Roper, and The King B, I'm Gene Lyons. Be sure to join us on Sunday for our Instacast covering the season three finale crisis theory. Thanks so much for listening. Stay safe. And as always, stay the fuck at home.